Hello again, this is Marxist, and this is my nine precepts of Scout. We're going to go over nine general rules that are sort of basic principles to how I think Scout should be played. I don't really have a lot of Scout content on my channel, so I figured this would be a good time to put this one out here. I've also got one more little rule than I did in the Romer video. In this video, I'll provide you with nine basic principles that I think are essential to scout play in the current 6v6 meta. It's always developing and changing, especially in regards to scout. So, if you're watching this years from now, assuming TF2 is even still alive, then maybe things have changed a little bit. Or, if you're an older guy that's maybe looking back into sixes, some things here are going to seem a lot different. These aren't meant to be the final word uh, on scout play, but it's basic principles that should be mastered in order to be a competent scout player. I also apologize in advance for not having any video clips in this particular video of mine, but this is more of an ideas thing, and video clips would sort of just make it all take a lot longer. So precept number one. When playing scout, you're subjected to offside rules like those found in soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, hockey, or dodgeball. I know it sounds like a bit of a stretch, but this is something that I see out of newer scouts all the time, and it's probably the easiest thing to fix. So just like in hockey, footy, whatever sport you want to talk about, there are certain lines that a certain player or players cannot cross, or they commit a foul, or are kicked out of the game, or whatever. This rule applies to scout as well. There are certain lines that you shouldn't cross if you want to play well and help your team. And this pertains to certain areas of the map. So this is my little demonstration map of Gully Wash Mid. The message that you're supposed to get out of this is that as a scout, you don't want to be going into chokes during transition fights or mids. You don't belong in your own chokes because you're better served standing to your medic if you're hurt and need to run away, or just staying in a group in general. Because when you go off by yourself, that's when people are going to make moves on you or on your team. And somebody's going to die and you don't want that in your life. Running into their chokes is always incredibly dangerous because you really don't have a lot of info ahead of time in most cases as to what's going to be coming around that corner. And if it happens to be a soldier that meets you in the face, you're not going to live very long. And if you run through the choke, you're not capping the point, and that's pretty essential, and we'll talk about that later. As to most rules in this game, there are exceptions. One is if the situation's dire enough, you can try and go for a back cap in some cases, which would make you violate the offsides rule because you're crossing through an enemy choke point. Sometimes back capping is okay. And other times, it's really not. A lot of lower skill level teams or newer teams tend to rely on the back cap or are sort of infatuated with the back cap itself. And you don't want that to be what your team's about or what your go-to strategy is if you're up against a wall because it's not going to work all the time. And the better the teams that you play, the less and less it's going to work. And if you become reliant on back caps to win games, you're going to end up hitting a glass ceiling at some point. If the point is going to be well capped, so there's already a scout or a pain train type person, this is the second exception by the way, it's okay for you to chase a kill out of the map area, so into an enemy choke. Under the condition that it is a wounded medic, you have more than 60 health and the medic is by him or herself. A lot of times you'll see a scout start chasing a kill. If it's not the medic, it doesn't matter. That guy's not going to come in and kill all of you, no matter how much health back he finds. If it is the medic, it's not essential unless your medic has died. So if you're a little hurt or there's no one else to cap the point, it's not a big deal. Just let him go. Now we're on to the second precept, which is simply put, cap points. Partly to justify to you what I'm about to say, we're going to go over how cap points work in TF2 just a little bit. Every map's capture time is a little bit different, but in general, this is how it works. So then there's a little chart there that I show you, 
and the timing is what's different. So, for example, Badlands Last goes in just over two seconds from a time to capper, but other points could take nine, twelve. Gravel Pit A took like twenty-four seconds, I think, or more. I can't remember exactly, but you'll see there that after the fifth capper your marginal return on your cappers goes way way down so generally having any more than times five on the point is not helpful and stacking points is something that you'll hear about or see some teams do and while it has its uses anything over five is really just kind of silly as a scout you automatically obviously cap at the times to right so you naturally have an advantage, and you should do it all the time. Now, the reason that you cap and the other players do not, besides the fact that you get the times to rate, is that your combo, the people that play around your medic, are going to be better suited to pressuring points. A, because they're going to have more health, or if the medic isn't even a factor, it's the splash damage weapon is much better at keeping people out of doors than your scattergun is. So if your rocket shooters and your pipe guys are standing back capping the point and you're pressed up trying to keep people out, you're doing things backwards. You're, make, you're playing the game and making it too hard. Precept 3 is control the high ground, control the universe. This is a slide of the scariest thing in TF2. So why should you try to be on the high ground all the time? Well, your weapon packs a tremendous punch and basically anything that jumps at you or tries to run at you from the ground is going to get thrown down back to the ground very, very quickly, and they're not going to be able to hurt you. So by simply occupying the high ground, you deny it to the entirety of the other team, and it forces them to fight you or back out of the area, because you controlling the high ground gives your team the freedom to move around or occupy the high ground themselves, thus causing the other team to lose maneuverability and have to sort of clump together somewhere farther away. For our fourth rule, simply put, always abuse geometry or the terrain. Why shouldn't you just stay on the flat place? As a scout, always be on the lookout for props, stairs, and other areas that you can jump on and off of to confuse your opponents and make you harder to hit. The more you use the terrain to your advantage, the harder you are for your arch nemesis, the soldier class, to hit and kill you, and it can also help you in scout fights because you can manipulate the terrain or the geometry of the map to give you partial cover while you're still firing at them, so it's, it's a pretty straightforward idea of like hiding behind a crate. Because any scatter weapon has got a spread on it and some of those pellets are going to hit the wall instead of you. Whereas if they don't have any cover themselves, you're going to hit them pretty easily. This basically boils down, it's a lot like the high place. You want to be on high ground. This is sort of an addendum to that. Because you're given, every time you do this, you're giving yourself, or trying to get yourself, positional advantage. Precept number five is that while your class may be called Scout, you're actually a flak cannon. So why is it that you should always shoot your scattergun at something that's in the sky? One is that airborne targets have a difficult time dodging scattershot damage. And when you shoot somebody who is in the air, they often lose all control over their jumps and will fall straight to the ground or move in unintended ways. On their part, anyways. So by controlling the skies, you severely limit your opposition soldiers, who are your arch nemesis, by the way, and force the other team to figure out new ways to attack you. And if you also happen to control the high ground, that'd be really nice as well. 
the reason I make this its own rule is I remember when I first started mentoring teams, I had more than one scout tell me that they didn't believe shooting things in the sky was an appropriate use of their time. And all you have to do is play one game, just one match, go to your first mid and shoot the first thing that jumps at your team, the first thing to go in the air with your scatter gun, and even if you only do 20 damage to it, it should be pretty obvious as to why you want to do this all the time. And just like the roamer, be on the lookout for a buff is its own special rule. 185 is so much greater than 125. The main thing about this rule is that you should make getting a buff part of every plan. You should never push in without having getting a buff be part of what's going to happen at some point. Except for in one special case that we'll talk about later. In case you haven't watched my Roamer video yet, I'll go over how buffs work just a little bit. The metagun is essentially on a timer, and if you haven't taken damage in the last 10 or 15 seconds, you're going to heal up a lot faster than you would under normal conditions, that is, you were just shot a little bit ago. So going from 125 or even 1 health, to 185 will take 1 to 3 seconds if you haven't taken damage in the last 10 to 15 seconds. 15 is the max rate, 10 is rather close to the max rate. And your buff of 185 will remain for 15 seconds unless you take damage. It'll actually tick down until you're at 125 again for every 15 seconds. So in relative to other classes, because you have a very low amount of health, your buff actually hangs around for quite a while, whereas the heavy's buff, which also only lasts 15 seconds, ticks down very rapidly. If you have a buff, you should be fighting, unless you're capping. Oftentimes the difference between an open and an IM scout, or I would say main and now invite too, is how you utilize buffs. Utilizing buffs is one of the most important things, and we'll go into that a little bit later. The general rule here is though is that basically if you recognize any opportunity for you to get healed especially during fights you should probably take it. Precept 7 is a small talk about the what I see as the two roles of scout at mid. For a while there's been talk about two different kinds of scout, the passive and the aggressive scout. I don't like those words, so I've changed them. The passive scout I like to call the mama bear scout. I think it implies what the passive scout should be doing a lot better, because passive implies not really taking fights, kind of avoiding damage, you don't want to do that as the passive scout. And the aggressive scout Aggressive tends to imply to me stupidity, or just attacking because, and that's really not what you ought to be doing when you're playing Social Services Scout. And I'll go over what these two things mean in depth. So I've got a checklist for each of the two scouts at mid. If you're the Mama Bear Scout, here's your checklist. Protect the demo and medic and get a big buff early. Use your scatter gun and, if necessary, your whole body to deny any and all jumpers and any scout that rushes at you or the demo. And if anybody gets close enough to the demo that they're going to start doing significant damage to him if they hit him, I would say that that distance would be roughly equivalent to... The distance from the very edge of the train car on mid of Badlands to the point itself, the middle of the point. So pretty close. Medi I'd say that that's like the low end of medium range. If they get there, you need to get up in their face and physically block them from progressing. The same goes for jumping soldiers. Just jump straight into them and they'll shoot you and you'll shoot them and then they'll die. 
because they've taken a tremendous amount of damage and have rocket jumped and other things like that body blocking things is really effective early on at mid and ideally you're going to be relatively close to your demo who your medic should be rather close to also so you should pretty much be getting healed throughout that and that's how you function i don't like the word passive here because as soon as anything gets close to the little area that you've claimed for yourself you have to go absolutely bananas crazy on it and that's where i get the mama bear thing from is you're not going to go running into the other team or try to do anything particularly aggressive early on you're just going to kind of watch how things develop and then get a fat buff and if nothing has really happened to your team yet then you can run off and die but as a mama bear if anything starts to threaten your cubs then you have to go crazy and tear its throat out now the aggressive or the social services scout at mids checklist make sure the opposition's mama bear isn't a deadbeat if you see that their demos completely naked and unprotected you need to make a snap decision and if they aren't a deadbeat return to your medic for a buff and then go off and die if you see that the demo man is there alone and nothing is coming to protect him or you see that both of their scouts are running around somewhere together you need to run and kill their demo man right at the start of mid and then put it in a frag video aggressive scouts the wrong term because you don't necessarily commit yourself to dying straight away you're only a distraction if you're ignored then you can commit to frags because nothing's looking at you or they're not taking shots at you your primary job is to scare the demo and scare the enemy team scouts into shooting at you and then run away from them because they'll kill you because you're it's 1v2 or 3 what you're doing there is they're shooting ammo at you and also looking at you and so your medic and two soldiers who are the last people to arrive to mid in generally most cases will be able to do what it is that they're going to do without being harassed by the demo man and both scouts on the other team i should be careful to note though that this dichotomy only exists in my little world at mid in other cases a scout is a scout with a buffed scout being the best scout precept eight to dive the point or not to dive the point this is a topic that comes up a lot with scout players at last pushes so before we get into all of that i should t say that there are two generalized methods to pushing last one is that you kill everyone and then cap the point that's not going to be talked about here there's a second more commonly used method or more popular i should say where you have one scout go onto the point die on it because there's usually a sticky trap there or a whole bunch of players collapse onto him and when you bait the point you either win the game immediately because they don't get on the point fast enough or you don't die in the sticky trap or everyone comes and stands on the point to stop it from being capped now that there are no stickies on it or there's time put on it that it's partially capped so that's what we're going to talk about here the reason it works is because they all go stand on the point and then your team just kills them because they're all standing in a big group now if you have decided to bait the point you should know ahead of time that that's the strategy also you should know ahead of time which scout it is that's going to be baiting the point because i've seen it happen more than once where both scouts will immediately go and bait the point and that's one of the stupidest possible things that you could ever have happen so now i'll talk about how it is that you go about baiting the point if it's an uber v uber fight which you should know about going into in 99 percent of the cases that you push in or your medic isn't doing their job you should bait the point one to five seconds after the enemy's uber ends 
ideally you're going to be really close to that one to three one to two second range you don't want to stand on the point while they're ubered because they're not going to worry about you a whole lot and also uh, people aren't going to drop down to help because the players on the point are invincible and so they're still spread out and your bait didn't work if they don't have uber and you want to bait the point then you're going to use your uber for a timing and you want to get on the point basically a second to three seconds after your Uber is over so that your medic in pocket or whoever you brought in with the Uber can kind of get some breathing space for a little bit while they panic about you on the point for a second or two. It's kind of a big deal for your pocket who's going to need to reload rockets. And that's the easy timing method of baiting the point. And our ninth bonus precept is that when you're on the flank, you should play Quake or Warsaw. Now, I'm not totally deluded. I don't mean play Quake as a substitute for MGE or, or pugging or anything like that. You don't even really need to actually play the game Quake. What I mean is that the style of Quake duels is essentially how you should play on the flank. It's an absolutely perfect version of what you should do when you want to play on the flank. If you've never seen a Quake Duel before, there's a Twitch TV channel called Face It TV. I think they also have a website, probably a YouTube as well. If I find one, I'll put it in the comments or in the description for the video. Or any old Quake VOD of any of the great Quake Duelers would be good to watch. And that's not so much for the playing of the quake but for what they do when they play 1v1s in quake there are a lot of very important ideas to that such as health pickups positional advantage health armor keeping leads and attacking and baiting people so here are a couple ideas and how they would apply to tf2 when you're fighting anyone be mindful of whether there is a health pack around or not. If you want to win that fight, you need to deny them from the use of that health pack. Or you need to get it. Positional advantage. Do you have high ground? Are you standing on something you can hide behind slightly? Is there any escape route for you? Where do they have to go if this fight doesn't go well for them? Those sorts of things. Now, with TF2, you have heals or buffs, and I really, really feel like that's a, an equivalent to, although there are buffs in Quake as well, armor in Quake. If you've got good armor or overheals, you've got a better chance, a much better chance of defeating your opponent. You shouldn't really be doing anything if you don't have a buff. Because chances are, their guy has a buff, and he's going to kill you. Or it's going to be much easier for him to kill you. How to keep a lead. Don't take fights that you don't need to take. Just chill out, enjoy the fact that you're stacked with your fat buff, and that you've got nice positioning. You don't need to chase frags once you're already winning, is the big thing there. And if you're not winning in Quake Duels... You have to figure out how to get yourself in on somebody who's going to have an advantage on you of some sort. And that's either by timing them out or just suicide attacking them again and again. But mostly it's done by baiting. You know that the guy is going to have to go pick up some rocket ammo or that he's going to want to go pick up this armor type and you try to kill him while he does that. And that's a big thing for TF2 as well. If you hit a couple good shots on a guy and he runs away, almost guaranteed that he's going to the medic or health pack. So you can aim ahead of him a little bit and get an easy shot that way. Or you'll notice that a certain scout player likes to always go to a particular place. You can bait him out there. So on and so forth. It, it's very, very nice for a flank player to watch a quick duel. Just, just a quick one. You know, they don't last very long. But just thinking in that way is how the flank as scouts and roamer as well ought to behave. You don't want to take fights that aren't to your advantage. So many scout players just fight because they're there. 
And you don't want to do that. You only want to take fights that you know you can win or that you know you have some kind of benefit to. There's obviously a ton more I could say about playing Scout, but these are just nine basic rules that if you master them, you'll become a pretty good Scout. So this was made by Marxist, and I hope you enjoyed the video and found it to be informative. Post any questions or comments below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Until next time.